is about the artist's place in Britain today. In particular, his problem of earning a living and securing his place in society through the exercise of his imagination and his professional skill. This problem is most acute for the painter or the sculptor whose work seems strange and unacceptable. Jacob Epstein is a famous case of this dilemma. Here is sculpture by a man who has had to fight for public recognition. Although these bronzes may not now seem obscure, we should remember that his recent exhibition at the Tate Gallery was partly due to his slow conquest of general opinion. And here at the Tate also are the works we owe to the patrons of the past. And Turner's picture of Petworth House in Sussex reminds us of the age of aristocratic patronage. From the 17th century onwards, the masters of Petworth employed English artists to make their portraits and to enrich their rooms with every kind of decoration. These men and their contemporaries in England and abroad bought art on a huge scale. And this painting by Turner is one of many acquired during that painter's lifetime. And the walls of this room show how generously he was supported. When Turner was a guest at Petworth early in the last century, this picture gallery was being stocked with the modern art of the time. The gallery was built and the pictures were bought by Turner's friend, the greatest of Petworth's collectors, the third Lord Egremont, whose portrait still looks down upon his work. The taste of this remarkable man didn't always lead him to works of enduring value. Sometimes he bought what was fashionable rather than good. But that generosity which he bestowed so freely upon the poor of the district and the servants of his vast estates was also available to the artists of his generation. It is said that even the deer in Petworth Park were happier than any animals on earth. But although some of these houses can still show their treasures as a monument, their patronage is past and can hardly be revived. The Industrial Revolution created a new kind of wealth and founded new cities. But this wealth and enterprise didn't help the painter and the sculptor to find his place in a new society. The works of old masters have now moved into museums and galleries. But these do not employ the living artist as the great houses used to do. At least one form of patronage, however, has survived. The demand for the portrait, which has been constant in England from the 16th century. Rodrigo Moynihan is one of those painters whose portraits have preserved the vitality of this tradition. The portrait painter has always been favoured by the Royal Academy, whose founder, Sir Joshua Reynolds, was a portrait painter himself. The Academy is the oldest and most famous of the societies holding public exhibitions. Since 1769, artists have brought their work here for the summer show, a free shop window for their talent. Nowadays, the selection committee chooses about 1,500 works each year, but their taste is limited and will not meet the needs of all. No exhibition, indeed, at Burlington House or wherever it may be, can be sufficient in itself, either for the young artist or for the established one. And as our problem begins with the student, let us take the case of one student in particular. His name is John Jones. He came from an art school in Bristol to work here at the Slade School in London. Study at the Slade is concentrated upon either painting or sculpture, and upon the technique and history of those arts. 
In 80 years, many famous artists have worked in these studios and have climbed this staircase. Jones is one out of 14,000 students working in the art schools of Great Britain. For the three years at the Slade, he has some security. Even when he first arrives, he will find the stimulus of working with other students, and he will find there, too, the guidance of the staff. And besides that, he has somewhere to work. In the Slade studios, he learns the technique of his profession. He begins to discover the things to which his eye and imagination will respond. As the months pass, as his education and self-education progresses, his pictures multiply. But for the moment, at least, his livelihood does not depend on selling them. The idea of a life divided between bohemian adventure and a dirty attic is romantically false. But all the same, cheap studios and lodgings are hard to find, particularly in London. And in London, he'll probably like to stay, as it offers more in opportunity and in experience than any city in Britain. And it's difficult also to find that sort of work which will allow him to satisfy his interests and his ambitions. And this is just the moment in a painter's career, with the years of preparation and training behind him, when discouragement may easily breed. Having found somewhere to work and live, now he needs a public for the pictures that he's painting. And this will probably lead him to the galleries of those art dealers who exhibit and sell modern art. There are not many of these galleries, most of them within a mile of Piccadilly Circus. Together, in a single year, they can find room, perhaps, for exhibitions by a hundred artists. And it would be uncommon for one so recently a student to persuade a dealer to give him a room for a one-man show. But still, he may reasonably hope that one or two pictures will get taken somewhere for a mixed exhibition. If a picture is sold for 15 or 20 pounds, deduct the dealer's commission, the price of the frame, and the materials, and there isn't much immediately to show for those years of training. We must leave John Jones and look ahead to an artist who has already won recognition. Dealers will not hesitate to give him a show, and it's certain he will find on his frames the red labels which mean a painting has been sold. These pictures are by Keith Vaughan. His name is familiar to those interested in contemporary art, and he's shown his work abroad as well as here in England. But in spite of this, his painting doesn't give him more than a modest income. He cannot command the impressive studio or the style of living achieved by some portrait painters able to charge a thousand guineas for a picture. He finds it necessary to teach in a school of art and to take work of other kinds. Even an artist at the height of his career, like John Piper, faces similar problems but he's been able to combine his painting with more public activities. For 20 years, he's pursued the kind of independent experiments typical of modern art. At the same time, his interest in design and his enthusiasm for architecture have won him a following among those who couldn't buy his pictures. His studio is filled with the evidence of this versatility. It was here that he designed his pavilions for the Battersea Pleasure Gardens. Here he worked on the books which he's written and illustrated.
And here, too, are his theatrical models, for he's become one of our most successful designers for opera and for ballet. And indeed, not only theatres, but other public places, restaurants and offices or the underground, can bring the painter in touch with many who wouldn't otherwise interest themselves in art. The post office, petrol companies, the London transport executive are all examples of enlightened advertisers who've employed artists in the medium of the poster. Work of this kind is a service to the very wide public it addresses, and it's also a useful opportunity for the artist, although it's not in this medium that he'll achieve his most important work. This is a new form of employment, one which arises from a lively social demand which is certain to continue. And in fact, we are divided between such new kinds of patronage and a desire to preserve older forms, such as designing for tapestry. For many years, the Edinburgh Tapestry Company have kept alive this studio. They have commissioned designs from some of our best artists. They may weave tapestries for the new Coventry Cathedral. But this enterprise is threatened by economic pressure, by the cost of this art, which few can now afford, and by such a common consideration as the purchase tax. What should we feel then about the present situation? I went to see the sculptor Reg Butler. And I asked him what he, as a teacher, as well as an established artist, thought about these problems. And I found that he, for one, was still optimistic about the young artist's chance of finding a patron. Well, I think it's awfully easy to get too sentimental about artists starving in gas. Art today is a very personal thing, and being an artist is a personal activity. And I think one has to decide to make things run on one's own account. Any student between leaving art school and establishing some kind of personal communication is bound to think, find things tough. It seems that anyone with talent has got to be prepared to earn his living, make ends meet by all kinds of jobs. And I don't think it's a bad thing either. For one thing, if he's got enough talent, and above all is convinced that what he's doing is worthwhile, and that's the important thing, there are still lots of people about, a surprising number of people, who are prepared, in spite of high taxation and all the other troubles one hears about, these people are prepared to buy art. Peter Mayer is one of those who still buy art. Now, I buy pictures because I like them, and because I want to live with them. And to get in my own home, some of the pleasure I get in the gallery. And yet in rather a different way. There are quite a few types of painting which are too insistent or too superficial to hang in your own home, which are most effective in a gallery. However, once you're sure of your taste, know what you like, in fact, then the longer you have a painting or a piece of sculpture, the more you like it and the more you get from it. Pictures like these in Peter Mayer's collection are not necessarily expensive, but there are still many artists who will look for their main support to such a private individual exercising his personal taste. A young painter like Patrick Heron will probably sell most of his work to private collectors from his studio or from the walls of his dealer's gallery. But private patronage must be augmented by the kind of employment which can only come from business or industry, from public institutions or the state. The chief agent of state patronage is the Arts Council of Great Britain. The Council's Fine Arts Department has a growing collection of modern painting and sculpture, but its main purpose 
is not so much to employ the artist directly as to enlarge the artist's public. From their headquarters in London and their regional offices, hundreds of exhibitions have been sent throughout Britain. By this means, the Council has aimed to encourage the widest enjoyment of the arts in small towns and in the great provincial cities. Many of these splendid exhibitions which the Arts Council has arranged in London have brought work to us which would otherwise be little known or difficult to see. The outstanding show of Mexican art at the Tate Gallery was an example of this most valuable service. In the packing room of another public body, the British Council, we can see how this process of international exchange can also work the other way. Their fine art department has arranged shows of British art abroad and helped many of our artists to gain recognition overseas, sometimes through the great international exhibitions held in Venice and Paris and elsewhere. These public organizations and museums like the Tate Gallery work for the artist's public. But who does employ the artist more directly? One hotel, at least, a hotel in Scarborough, has a fine collection of paintings made by its owner, Mr. Tom Lawton. Mr. Lawton believes that pictures, both of the past and the present, are an essential part of the service a hotel should offer. They give an interesting and elegant setting for the visitors. And I was particularly interested in his modern pictures. Do you find that your visitors enjoy those pictures or do they find them rather difficult? I think most of the young people like them. Some people are puzzled by them and some actively dislike them. But everyone is stimulated by them. I find the contemporary pictures much the most interesting. They're a challenge to one's judgment and it's very rewarding seeing people gradually come to accept them and like them. This is a private, personal collection made public. But on a great liner like the Orense, it's a matter of a business corporation employing artists such as Edward Borden and Douglas Annand who were commissioned to create an attractive and entertaining background for the life of a ship. In fact, ocean liners, airports, blocks of offices may employ the artist as palaces and great houses did in the past. In the new Time Life offices in Bond Street, painters and sculptors and designers under the direction of Sir Hugh Casson worked with the architect from the beginning. And architects today are more willing than they were before the war to see the wide surfaces of their rooms enriched with painted or sculptured decoration. Such conditions demand a generation of artists as versatile as the men of the Renaissance. Every detail in this building, the handles on the doors, the lamps, the carpets and curtains, the furniture in the offices and conference rooms, the sculptures by Henry Moore, on the terrace and on the facade. All these combine in a remarkable unity of style. Moore has also made this family group in bronze 
for a school in Hertfordshire. That county has commissioned many artists to decorate their fine new schools, and education authorities in many parts of Britain now realize that the painter and the sculptor can not only brighten school buildings, but bring new interests and excitements for the children. employs the artist in this way. It also employs him as a teacher, at a time when painting and modeling and the crafts have become as much a part of the child's education as reading or writing. artist as a teacher, is that something to be welcomed or is teaching to be despised as a second best employment? One of those who has a firm belief in the vocation of teaching is Clifford Ellis, who worked on this mural in one of the Hertfordshire schools. Mr. Ellis is the principal of the Bath Academy, whose centre is Corsham Court, a famous house and a wonderful setting for a school of art. When I visited Corsham and talked with him about this question, he explained to me how the students, in the course of their training, work with children from schools in the district. And I suggested that we did need to think again about the artist's place as a teacher in view of the difficult realities of the present time. It seems to me that these realities of the outside world are so uncertain that it's our job here to provide such a training that the student is, as it were, centrally placed. He has a core of skills, of what I call academic disciplines, of culture, and with that core, his equipment, he's then able to face this outside world. And when one looks at the reality of it, it's clearly no fault of ours that the greatest opportunities are in our teaching. Now, I would really like to say something about that, because unluckily there's a kind of prejudice against teaching, which I think is a recent one. People tend to compare an ideal as an artist, say Michelangelo, and compare him with some workaday teacher, whereas the, the, the proper fair thing to do would be to compare that kind of artist with a great teacher. And if one is thinking of teaching as an ideal, which is what we try to do here, then that core must have in it all the things which will enable that kind of ideal to be realized. Here then the student learns those skills and disciplines to which Clifford Ellis referred, techniques which will serve him in his own studio or in the classroom. The student has the guidance of distinguished artists who are themselves teachers. The painter William Scott, the sculptor Kenneth Armitage among them. The artist in his studio. We need him as much as ever before in a world dominated by the constructions of science and of industry. We've seen how he can humanize and enrich our surroundings. Like the contemporary architect, he can give form and spirit to a civilization of the machine. Can we employ him also to express the traditions of the past and the ideas and beliefs of our period?
these sculptures were entries in a competition for a monument to the unknown political prisoner. The theme is a part of our life today. It was the challenge to the artists who took part, and their work was often a challenge to our sympathy and appreciation. And indeed, the problem of patronage is largely the problem of understanding the shape of our time. Those who face that challenge can often earn a marvelous response. This Madonna and Child by Jacob Epstein was commissioned by a London convent, by the church, the church which was formerly the artist's most constant patron. And here at St. Matthew's, Northampton, this crucifixion by the painter Graham Sutherland shows how a modern artist will respond to the symbols of an ancient faith. The crucifixion and a Madonna and child carved by Henry Moore, which stands in the opposite transept, are the fruits of bold and sympathetic patronage. Here then are some of the problems and opportunities facing the artist today. And they exist not only for him, but for the whole community in which he lives. The fact that the painter Ivan Hitchens is engaged on this huge mural is a sign that a patron has had the vision to command a major work and that the artist has had the courage to respond.